let's assume that Donald Trump is back in office um, and we're stuck with the same situation that we have currently in Ukraine and the same situation that we have currently in the Red Sea. What happens day one? <laughs> Let's start with the Red Sea. I mean, Trump is uh, is known as the deal maker. That that that's the image he wants to build. And um, what he did vis a vis Iran was the opposite of that. It was the deal breaker. Uh, he pulled out of the Iranian nuclear deal, and that's the reason why at the moment the U.S. really have no negotiation routes into Iran. You're listening to Macro Sunday, Andreas Steno, founder of Steno Research, and um, I'm joined by my partner Mikkel Rosen. Well, welcome to you. Thanks a lot for this uh, discussion on. A potential war between the U.S. and Iran. Today, we're joined by Jacob Shapiro, the uh, geopolitical strategist of Cognitive Investments, for a discussion on whether we will see further escalations between the U.S. and Iran in light of uh, everything that's ongoing in the Red Sea and in Israel Gaza. This is, of course, of uh, great relevance to financial markets, not least given a um, smoking hot development in the U.S. labor market. Uh, just before going on air here, um, we received a smoking hot job report from the U.S. on Friday, and um, not least job creation looked almost artificially strong. I think it's very spreadsheet driven, but especially wage growth is on its way up again, and that obviously relates to the inflation picture. So we'll talk to Jacob in uh, 10 minutes time around the situation in the Red Sea and whether the US and Iran are closing in on a full-blown war. But we'll also discuss the ramifications for markets, for shipping markets, for inflation uh, projections and all that, Mikkel. I'd like to start with sort of a brief status on what's ongoing in the Swiss. Uh, we track the shipping data on a daily basis. So the great overview here is the situation improving. Not really. Uh, you could say that it's, it has uh, stabilized to some extent mm. uh, because uh, uh, you can really go lower than zero ships almost. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we still see some Russian or local ships going through there, but, uh, but, but, and, but, I mean, the, the most recent development is, of course, the, the, the spillover into, into dry bulk and, uh, and oil. Uh, we've seen a stabilization in, uh, uh, in freight rates, uh, mm. slight dips over the past week, but these are still dips of 5 to 10% that come on top of a uh, 300% increase quarter on quarter. So, I mean, it's, it is a, a small correction, I'd say. And, Miguel, one thing that um, I'm still worried about is that we're currently in, this, in sort of the season of relatively low good shipping activity yeah um what if this is not resolved by march that then this be starts to become a major issue because in uh, uh, in early q2 we see a lot of the uh, the christmas gifts being shipped out uh, that <laughs> might sound yes. a little strange but 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 that is that is the case we we we, we usually we usually see a hump in, in in container traffic in that period which is among other things related to to uh, to the storing or to building up the storage of the mm. the, the the goods that have been going uh, that's that's going to be sold for the for the upcoming Christmas season. So if we start to tap into that, if we see disruptions uh, going into that, it, it it's 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 starts to spiral this. Mm. And um, Miguel, when we look at the risk of an of an escalation between Iran and the U.S. and the Red Sea, I mean, mm. obviously Iran has been attacking via proxies basically yes um any risk of this actually turning into a direct confrontation between the u.s and iran no that's not the way i see it right now of course there's always a risk but 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 it seems like for the moment that uh the iranian militias who attacked the u.s and killed a couple of u.s servicemen in jordan uh, uh more or less apologized uh and 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 stated that they w wouldn't carry out any further attacks i think that was uh, uh by decree from from Iran, to basically basically send a message to to US okay, that okay we're not going to do this anymore we're not going to go further so you don't have to to push a heavy retaliatory strike which we, which we've been waiting for since then so for now it seems like uh, a lid has been put on the uh, on, on things down there but but it's yeah tensions are still high yeah and it leads me to the Donald Trump soundbite of the week <laughs> uh, Miguel probably our favorite part of the uh, weekly yeah. show. Um, so let's listen to Donald here discussing, um, well, a comment he made on a girl he met. <laughs> Let me put it like that. When you said in that video that Ms. Leeds would not be your first choice, you were referring to her physical looks, correct? Just the overall, not, I, I look at her, I see her, I hear what she says, whatever. 
You wouldn't be a choice of mine either, to be honest with you. I hope you're not insulted. I would not, under any circumstances, have any interest in you. I'm being, I'm honest when I say it. Uh, she, I would not have any interest in. <laughs> <laughs> and um Michael, obviously unrelated to uh, the, the debacles in the Red Sea, this uh, this soundbite for Trump, it's just hilarious. Um, Michael, still, let's assume that Donald Trump is back in office um, and we're stuck with the same situation that we have currently in Ukraine and the same situation that we have currently in the Red Sea. What happens day one? <laughs> Let's start with the Red Sea. I mean, Trump is uh, is known as the deal maker. That that that's the image he wants to build. And um, what he did vis a vis Iran was the opposite of that. It was the deal breaker. Uh, he pulled out of the Iranian nuclear deal, and that's the reason why at the moment the U.S. really have no negotiation routes into Iran to stop the Houthis. Because with most in most with most other countries, if a proxy group of that country were carrying out these attacks, you would basically pick up the phone and call them and say, "What's it going to take? How are we going to stop this?" That communication doesn't seem to exist between the U.S. and Iran, among other things, because of of, of the pullout of the nuclear deal. So uh, in the Red Sea, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm. What could he really do? Uh, could he start negotiations negotiations with Iran f- from scratch? That wouldn't be in the, wouldn't be the best uh, position to do that from. So 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 I'm um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm very curious to see to see his takes on this. On Ukraine, I think it's pretty clear that that that, that Trump will try and scale down support for Ukraine and, and not support for the packages. Um, he will try and leave it to the Europeans, and he will try to come to some sort of deal with Putin, which will be very hard in itself. But we we, we can probably get back to that in another show. Yeah. But given the lack of progress in the Red Sea right now, given the smoking hot wage numbers out of the U.S. economy on Friday, let's talk a little bit about the ramifications for inflation. Um, we received the January inflation data from the Eurozone this week, uh, or last week, sorry. And um, outside of food, it was actually a pretty comfortable uh, or comforting number for the European Central Bank, in my opinion. Food prices increased 1% of the month in sharp contrast to our now cost of minus 1%. Um, so that major shock on the downside basically veined, you could say, um, relative to our forecast. But if we look at live pricing of foods in uh, various retailers in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in France, I think we have pretty decent evidence of, of an actual drop in prices. Uh, it's kind of the same signal we get from the input prices on food. Mm. So. Assuming that food prices actually drop in February with the time lag, um, I'm still fairly confident that the ECB will be surprised substantially on the downside uh, of their inflation projections for the first quarter. Speaking of the US, I'm getting increasingly convinced that um, it will be tricky for the Fed to cut at all. I mean, mm-hmm. um, wage growth at uh, reaccelerating to four and a half, compensation plans are up no matter who you ask um, in the U.S. corporate sphere. Forward-looking indicators are improving. Um, The recession is nowhere to be seen. I don't think it's an easy task to get rates down here. Um, And it might be that we get a melt-up before a meltdown rates-wise, but, uh, well, if you ask me right here on the spot, I simply struggle to see the case for a rate cut. Uh, While the rate cut perspectives are much more there uh, in in the eurozone still uh, and it might be that we get a cyclical rebound at some point during the year as well but for now it's simply it's impossible to see that rate cut case in the us and that's going to be a huge disappointment for markets yeah at, at, at least rates markets clearly yeah, yeah, uh, rate clearly, markets, yeah. clearly clearly and well <laughs> let's see i mean our major trend bet for the year is that the eurozone prospects of rate cuts will basically be much firmer than they will Mm. in the US. And this is another confirmation of that, um, where we completely uh, prepared for it uh, with that job report, obviously not. Um, It seems like the Bureau of Labor Statistics still struggles uh, with getting the seasonality right. Uh, I would have betted on a deduction due to um, three years in a row of complete mishits in January, but they still miss it. So, um, well, let's see. And given that, Miguel, I think it's timely to bring Jacob Shapiro into this discussion Absolutely. because if we add goods inflation from the Red Sea to this mix, mm. well, you're only adding on top of an already existing inflation issue mm. in the US. Um, and Jacob um, is based out of New Orleans, as far as I remember. Um, 
obviously with close contacts in uh, in DC. Uh, so it will be very interesting to hear his takes on the US response to everything that's ongoing in the Red Sea. So um, here's the intro music for Jacob Shapiro. And since he's from New Orleans, let's listen to the animals House of the Rising Sun. The head of geopolitics at uh, Cognitive Investments to the Macro Sunday podcast. Again, it's been a while since we hosted you uh, during the uh, awesome Jacob. It's great to see you again. Uh, the pleasure's mine. And I don't know, it, like time and space have no meaning when you're covering geopolitics anymore. I feel like we chatted just the other day, but it was probably six months ago at this rate. I can't keep track. <laughs> I, I think it was, yeah. But I mean, Jacob, since then, uh, we've had plenty of developments within the geopolitical space, not least in the Middle East. So over the course of the past couple of weeks, we've seen growing tensions between Iran and the US. And um, we've had discussions internally here on whether this is something we should worry about. So let's listen to an American on this question. Is this something that worries DC right now? Well, I'm not a typical American, so I'm not sure that I can speak for the for the establishment inside the Beltway, as it were. I also, I mean, I, I'm a global macro analyst now. I cut my teeth in the Middle East. That's what my like graduate and undergraduate training is in. That's where all my languages are. So it's it's weird to kind of come back to the Middle East. And I I got bored in some ways with the Middle East because the story of the Middle East is always the same. These people don't like each other. They bomb each other, and then <laughs> nothing ever actually changes in the Middle East. So. Um, there's that to say on the top of it. I, I would be a little contrarian, though, and this is where I would probably differ than somebody you would talk to inside of Washington, in the sense that I don't see that Iran wants a conflict right now. Um, if anything, I think Iran is trying to tamp the brakes. And the one silver lining in all of this is none of the state actors, save maybe Israel, have any interest in escalation whatsoever. And I think you can see this in what happened this week. So go back to the beginning of the week. Um, some U.S. soldiers in Jordan die in a drone attack that was made by Iran-backed militias either in, in Syria or Iraq. You got Biden come out being all strong. The United States is going to respond. Maybe we're going to get that escalation. The next day, what happens? The, the proxy group in Iraq comes out and says, we're suspending all attacks on U.S. assets. Nothing to see here. Please don't hurt us. We didn't mean to. Sorry, we went past the red line. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was quite a, quite a stark announcement where they said, okay, we're not going to attack U.S. assets anymore. And I would be willing to bet a lot of the money in my pockets that one of the reasons that happened was because in Iran, they probably called up those guys and said, hey, like we gave you some nice drones and missiles. We didn't say you could kill American soldiers in Jordan. What are you doing? Um, so I think that's sort of the silver lining there. But to your point, um, we still have Red Sea shipping disruptions that have not been resolved for months, are probably not going to be resolved for months. And we have the much vaunted US Navy completely apparently unable or unwilling to put the Houthis back in the bottle and just and to get the Houthis to stop firing ships so that uh, missiles so that ships can start going back and forth in the Red Sea. That was almost imaginable even six months ago, even 12 months ago, if you're in the multipolar thesis like I am. So it's not all great. And there's a lot to be worried about. But I would say the one thing this week that maybe I'm not worried about is state on state conflict between the US and Iran. I don't think either side wants that right this second. Jacob, speaking of uh, shipping lane troubles in the Red Sea and in the Suez Canal, how important are these troubles for global macro and the geopolitical environment in your view? I think they're incredibly important. And they're important from a local level, a regional level, and then at a global level. At a local level, I think one thing that people are not talking about is Egypt has already been sort of a macro basket case for a little while now. Um, it's not the type of country that can lose all of those tolls that come through, through the Suez. So I've been wondering if this is going to strain Egypt, maybe if, if it's also going to strain Turkey. Sitting on the Bosphorus, suddenly you've got, you know, the Red Sea is not good, the Black Sea is not good. On a local level, I think it's bad for those economies. At the regional level, it hasn't impeded the, the export of oil from the region. And until that happens, and we're sort of still in this Goldilocks land where, yes, we're going to get increases in shipping rates. And yes, there's going to be problems in terms of like maybe we'll get some unexpected inflation peaks in places like Europe when it comes to food or auto parts or you know, things that are dependent on this particular supply chain. Um, but that, that's where I think we would really get global. If we start talking about not just the Red Sea, but the Persian Gulf, if we start seeing, well, they can't get the oil exports out because of some of what's happening. If the Houthis train their sites on Saudi oil refineries or production capacity, which they did a couple of years ago, like now we're starting to talk 
sort of global global picture scenario. So um, it's obviously important. And I, I think the one thing that it really underscores, I was saying this with my partner on the phone just before we got on the podcast, you know, a lot of us have been talking about a multipolar world that was really just a thesis up until now. You could read it in some of the economic data. You could read it in some of the trade data. But for me, it's now just a proven fact. I think historians will look back at January, February 2024 and say, that was the moment where the United States was not the most powerful country in the world, where the U.S. Navy could not guarantee global shipping. That was the whole point of globalization. That was what underpinned the whole thing. If the United States can't do that anymore, we're in a fundamentally different world. So I, I do think we'll look back at this as an inflection point and to the extent that both countries and companies are thinking about the future, like now they're having things that are, okay, I can't get my thing from point A to point B because it could get blown up. Like we're not arguing about economic data anymore. It's a fact. Mm. Uh, sending to you live from, from Copenhagen here, uh, Jacob, we're obviously close to a couple of, of the Danish shipping giants and they, they typically tell us that they call DC every time there are troubles within uh, important shipping lanes, right? So the Americans right now How much of a thing is it for them to solve this goddamn situation in the Red Sea, and how will they solve it? I have some sympathy for the White House because hindsight is always 2020. So I think at the start of this, they didn't want to push too hard because they were afraid of a regional war. So they thought maybe with just stern warnings, they could get the Houthis to back off. Um, the Houthis didn't back off, so now they're trying to attack the Houthis and degrade their military capability, but the Houthis have now been emboldened. They think they're strong. And also Iran has been supporting and funding them and providing them with all sorts of capabilities for a long time now. So I think the United States made the mistake of, of not going hard enough at first. And now the genie's out of the bottle and it's going to be very hard to put the genie back into the bottle. I think it was a both a tactical and a strategic mistake for the Biden administration. I think they were worried about the election. I think they were worried about Trump getting out on the campaign trail and saying, oh, look at this, they're getting us involved in another Me Middle Eastern conflict. I think they were worried about um, the prospects for regional war when probably the right thing to do should have been to nip it in the bud right away, to respond with overwhelming force against the Houthis and say, this is not going to happen. Um, that could still happen. The United States might still decide, hey, we really have to go after the Houthis and we have to degrade their capabilities entirely. But the one thing that Iran gets to say in all this is, not so easy to degrade the Houthi capability anymore. This is not just you know some ragtag group of militants as it was maybe even five years ago. Now they have anti-ship missiles. Now they're a little more sophisticated. Now, unless you're going to go after Yemen as a country, you're probably not going to be able to knock, it, knock out that capability. And for Iran, for China, for Russia, that's a great strategic success. You're increasing the cost of what it means for, to, bring you, <clears throat> to bring U.S. power to bear in the region. What about a peace deal in uh, in Israel? Uh, I mean, we saw rumors, was it on Thursday, um, from Al Jazeera, surrounding a potential deal being brokered by Qatar. And then all of a sudden, that headline was taken down again by Al Jazeera. Do you think that we have a path to peace uh, in Israel? And would it matter for the Red Sea situation by now? So... We can't dismiss the reports, even if I'm highly skeptical of them. So what I've seen is that, you know, Qatar has been talking to Hamas and has Hamas buy-in for some kind of three-pronged ceasefire where, you know, first it's going to be a certain exchange of prisoners and humanitarian convoys get uh, allowed access to the Gaza Strip. Then it's more prisoners in phase two. In phase three, we start talking about recognition of a Pal Palestinian state and things like that. Um, there is nothing to suggest the Israeli government would go along with that. And everything that Netanyahu has said thus far suggests that he wouldn't be open to that kind of deal. Now, that said, there are a couple things pushing against that. First of all, you might finally be getting enough domestic political pressure inside of Israel to just get the hostages home, that maybe Netanyahu is reconsidering his position. And maybe he's going to prioritize getting the hostages home over whatever the military objectives are in Gaza. The second thing is maybe the defense establishment is telling him there is no military objective here. You cannot destroy Hamas. Hamas is an idea. It's an ideology. And every single house that you bomb and bunker, that you, you're just creating more people that are going to want to join Hamas in the future. So you've gotten us involved in a war that the IDF was not built for. The IDF is built for lightning strikes and shock and awe and overwhelming victories. It is not built to be an occupation army in an open air prison for 12 months. That's sort of a worst case scenario. So maybe the defense establishment is putting pressure on Israel as well. Last but not least, You had an op-ed in the New York Times from Thomas Friedman this week talking about the quote-unquote Biden doctrine and about how it's going to be a, a combination of be strong against Iran, um, 
imminent recognition of a Palestinian state, and then um, deepening of U.S.-Saudi security ties along with normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Now, I normally don't give a hoot about what Thomas Friedman has to say in the New York Times, but instead of it being his opinion, he talked about it being quote-unquote reporting. And one of the things we know about Biden is he's really old school. He likes to leak stuff to columnists, and then the columnists put it out there in the ether, and then a month or two later, it's White House policy. That's what happened with the China detente over the past 12 months. Right after Pelosi visited Taiwan, David Ignatius in the Washington Post had an op-ed about how Biden doesn't want to be the author of a second Cold War. And then the next six to 12 months were really about the United States trying to lower the temperature there. All of which is to say, maybe the United States is also leaning on Israel and saying, okay, enough's enough. Like We need to figure out some sort of way to a ceasefire. So all of that tells me maybe there's pressure on Israel to agree to a ceasefire. Maybe Hamas has achieved its objectives and it's willing to consider some kind of peace deal. The problem with all of this to me is Netanyahu, it's not in Netanyahu's interest to stop the war, and he hasn't shown any willingness to do so. So maybe the pressure will be enough, but until I see the Israeli government actually coming out and embracing some of these things or agreeing to some of these things, I'm not going to put much stock in it. And you're exactly right in sort of the, the insinuation of your question, and who cares? Even if we get a ceasefire, are they actually going to follow it? And even if we get a ceasefire, I don't want us to make the mistake that um, everything that happens in the Middle East is somehow tied to Israeli-Palestinian peace. That's been a problem, not just for the United States, but for the world, literally since the 1980s and 1990s. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a nice thing that people use in, as an excuse to do whatever they want. But you think the Houthis are going to stop whatever they're doing or stop pushing their interests just because Hamas like reaches a, some kind of a ceasefire agreement brokered by Qatar with Israel? No. like The Houthis have their own interests and are activated by Iran for completely different reasons. So don't make the mistake of thinking that if you solve Israel-Palestine, suddenly all these other issues are going to go away. And that's, uh, I know I'm going on a little bit, but it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm a little confused at U.S. foreign policy. I don't know why every single U.S. president in the last months of their term thinks, oh, if I get Israel-Palestine peace, everything's going to be okay. Like, how many times do we have to see this movie fail and there's not peace in the Middle East to realize that's not a realistic foreign policy objective and it's not going to do anything? Mm. Fair point, uh, Jacob. If, if we look into a scenario of continued distress in the Red Sea, um, shipping lane disruptions continuing into spring, Who are the winners and losers of this situation if we look at it from a macro and financial market perspective? So I think the winners and losers for, for the Red Sea, it's it's a it's sort of a contained thing. So we talked about Egypt and Turkey. I'm a little bit concerned about them. If you're thinking about, you know, especially Asia to Europe trade, if there are different supply chains that are exposed to that in particular, like that would those are supply chains that I would be worried about. Right now, oil is fairly subdued. I'd be curious to know what you guys are thinking about oil prices because it surprised me how subdued oil prices are. If oil prices are going to stay like this, okay, so you're going to have some delays because you have to go around Africa, but it's not going to affect the bottom line that much because you can afford it with oil sort of this cheap. The, the bigger macro risk that I'm worried about is what if this gets beyond the Red Sea? Um, and you know, just to paint a really scary picture here, so you've even had reports lately of some companies, because of the shipping disruptions and because they don't want to tolerate the delays, they've been doing some air shipping from Asia to Europe. Well, air shipping is dependent on going through a very narrow route of the South Caucasus because Russian airspace is closed for a lot of these different transports because of the Russia-Ukraine war. What if Armenia and Azerbaijan decide to actually have a war? What if most of Eurasia is suddenly closed? to air traffic and things like that? What if we get a spike there? What if we get continued you know, uh, drought and water shortage issues in the Panama Canal? Are we going to look at more disruption there? What if something happens over in the Strait of Malacca or in the South China Sea, which is the concern that everybody and their mom was worried about six months ago? So the, the thing that is especially is not that any of these are probable, but when you start stacking on the what ifs and the risks, if you got the Red Sea and a Panama Canal disruption, or if you got the Red Sea and something going on in the South Caucasus, then I think we're talking about, you know, increased shipping prices, increased inflation that interest rates and the tools of central banks isn't going to do anything again. So if it just stays with the Red Sea, like I said, I'm watching certain supply chains that are vulnerable to that route. I'm watching countries like Egypt. I'm watching countries like Turkey. But I think the other thing to watch right now is to be super vigilant about these other choke points. Because if you start tacking on problems and other choke points with one that is already as critical as what's happening in the Red Sea, You know, then we start talking about really how that's going to affect inflation and how that's going to affect macroeconomic uh, policy. 
to be honest, Jacob, we're currently licking our wounds in a long oil bed. So thank you for asking about <laughs> <laughs> oil in particular. Um, we're struggling here. Um, I think this, the setup is pretty bullish, but um, it seems like the market is jumping at every opportunity to sell oil every time there is just a small chance of a de-escalation of the situation in the, in the Red Sea. Mikkel, we've also had um, news surrounding the European support of Ukraine over the past week. And I'll allow you to ask Jacob a few questions on namely Ukraine and the potential for distortions if Trump is the next president. Yeah, so I mean that's uh, that's a huge topic in the in uh, in our part of the world right now. Uh, obviously, the the EU reached an agreement of of about fifty billion dollars in in aid to Ukraine. Uh, in my opinion, that uh, yeah, that'll go so far, but but probably not enough to to kick out the Russians, uh, especially not if Ukraine starts running out of men. I mean, you can't put put dollars instead of men at some point. But what I would like to ask you, Jacob, is. Uh, What's the situation like in Washington? Is is the U Ukraine fati fatigue increasing, or or, or do, do you think we can expect as long as funding? Biden is president? I don't expect Ukraine fatigue to be expressed in policy. Now there is Ukraine fatigue in the electorate. If you look at the polling data, Americans are less interested in Ukraine and less willing to write a blank check than they were before. But Biden is not that way. Biden cares about the transatlantic relationship, cares about Ukraine. I think he will arm them and fund them as much as he can as long as he's president, which. You know, in some ways, there are a lot of reasons the U.S. election is the biggest geopolitical issue in the world this year, full stop. And one of them is because Trump would be a diametrically different policy, probably. Um, so I, th I think you've got a stable support in the White House, no matter what the polling data says up until November. But all bets are sort of off um, once you get to the election. You also mentioned, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about the EU deal to fund Ukraine with 50 billion euros. I mean, it's not men so much that I'm worried about. It's artillery shells and bullets. And it seems to me that, you know, the North Koreans have provided more artillery shells to Russia than the Europeans have to the Ukrainians. Like, that's a big problem. Um, and I'm, I'm also yeah. really curious um, why Orban decided not to object to the deal anymore. Did he get something? I saw Politico was saying that Maloney and Macron... You know, did a charm offensive with him. I didn't realize that he was uh, susceptible to charm offensives. He's been really recalcitrant this whole time. <laughs> um, you know, I wonder if it was finally threatening Article 7 and, and things about depriving Hungary of voting rights and things like that. I, but, I mean, Orban has usually been ahead of the ball here, so he must have seen something that, that made him want to withdraw. But, and then you know, the other thing that happened this week that we might look back as a big moment was the boil over of tensions between Zelensky and Zeluzhny, his... You know, the leader of the Ukrainian armed forces. Yeah. Um, again, like if you think six months ago, if, if we were talking six months ago, we were probably talking about Prigozhin, the caterer in ch chief who marched on Moscow and then suddenly got, you know, died in a tragic accident. Um, and we were talking about is, is Russia, is this regime going to be here in 12 months? Well, Putin has been able to put things back together. And meanwhile, you've got a stark division between the top two leaders in Ukraine. So even if you have the bullets and the ammunition and the money, Do you have a Ukrainian leadership that's unified in the fight pushing forward? I mean, it's, I have not been as worried about Ukraine as I am right now since the first month of the war. And I was somebody who was very, very bullish and optimistic even 12 months ago. I thought the counteroffensive was going to go well. So you're licking your wounds on, on long oil. I'm, I'm licking my wounds on Ukraine optimism and everything that went along with it. Yeah, we've we've been pretty pessimistic. I mean, I mean, basically, the the, the current situation on the ground favors Putin more than it favors uh, Zelensky. Uh, to be blunt, Putin has achieved a sort of divided Ukraine that can be associated with the EU and NATO, but not really accepted as members. Uh, and and I think Putin is okay to live with this uh, murky status quo at the moment. Um, with regards to Orban, that, that's a very interesting question, in my opinion, uh, or, or, or as I see it, we don't know yet. But I think he was bought with something to do with immigrants and Muslims. Uh, I think that's his currency. So uh, that would be my bet, but we, we'll have to see about that. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So, Jacob, you mentioned the... Uh trillion dollar <laughs> election um, question uh, out of the US by November um, as a risk that kind of outshines all of the risks that we've already discussed. So assuming that Donald Trump uh, takes office by, by January 25, what changes um, geopolitically both in Ukraine and in the Middle East? So I think there are two big changes that we know are going to happen and the rest are sort of up for discussion. 
Um, the U.S.-China detente, and it has been a detente. U.S.-China relations are pretty good right now relative to where they've been for the last six or seven years. That goes away on day one. And the question is how bad it gets. I mean, the trade war goes 100% back on, on the fold, and we start talking about Section 232 again and all these tariffs and things that the Trump administration did the first time around. No more surgical tariffs, no more, oh, we're going to have relations with you know, Chinese and American defense officials, but you know, all that goes away. Um, how bad it could get is what if Trump does what he did the first time he got elected and calls the president of Taiwan and starts making noise there. So U.S.-China relations go from, they've been relatively stable um, to, to suddenly unstable overnight, and everything that means for supply chains and global trade and things like that. The other thing that changes overnight um, is the transatlantic relationship. The Biden administration has, has spent a lot of time on rebuilding um, its alliance structure, especially with European countries. It wanted Europe to know, hey, the Trump administration was an aberration. The United States is here. We're your partners. We're your allies. We're going to figure out our trade issues. We're going to work together on defense, all these other things. That goes up in smoke if Trump gets elected. We start talking about trade war between the United States and Europe. And all of, you know, remember the Airbus Boeing dispute and all of the different, you know, you, you put the tariff on whiskey. We put the tariff on French cheese. We definitely lose that battle. I'll be joining you in Europe if that happens because I can't, if I lose my triple cream brie, what am I going to do with myself? Um, you know, that goes away sort of immediately. Um, the rest, you know, Trump is a very mercurial character. That's a fancy way of just saying he's very unpredictable. So I, I'm not willing to to go out on a limb and say much more. But if he wins, I've been telling both companies and investing clients with us, you need to take off, you know, the action plan for worsening U.S.-China relations and trade war, and you need to take off, uh, okay, what happens with worsening U.S.-EU ties, and also what does that mean for EU centralization in general? The ironic thing here, or the silver lining for the EU, would be I think a Trump election would be very good for EU unity because you would have to stop squabbling with each other and you'd have to say, okay, like we actually need to get our own house in order because everything Macron's been saying for the last three years that we made fun of him for, he was right. And, and we need to get things together. So I think it'd be good for the EU. But again, those are the two really big risks that I would be preparing for right now. So we should be cheering on Trump, Trump in other words, uh, indirectly here <laughs> <laughs> out of Europe. Um, Jacob, I'd, I'd like to ask you a final question surrounding all of this, because, I mean, we've talked about the risks in the Red Sea. We've talked about uh, the risks related to um, the situation um, around shipping. We've talked about the risk of the U.S. election turning into a stinker from a European perspective. So how do we trade all of this from a macro perspective? What are the trends that we can trade this year, given this Look, set of that's risks? Look, a, that's a great question, and it's something we think about every day at our firm, and I'm sure you're thinking about it at your firm. Mm. So, I mean, we have a couple different strategies here. I think mm. the one thing is, I guess what I would say about this is this is not a global environment where I want to trade that much. It's more where I want to invest and more where I want to be in the long term. Mm. So when we're thinking about you know, inter, um, investing in countries, we have a list of countries whose geopolitical fundamentals that we like who we think are going to do well in this kind of multipolar environment. Mm. Because for some countries, this is exactly the type of environment they do well in. Um, we have other countries for whom, either because of demographics or because of the way their economies are structured, we don't really like them in a multipolar geopolitical world. To put a little um, concreteness on that statement, um, Malaysia is an example of a country that is built for a unipolar globalizing world. It's all about trade. It's all about, um, you know, they want to make things there that are assembled in other parts of the world. Um, it's it's a major part of their economy. Indonesia is not. Indonesia has been all about vertical integration and protection of Indonesian businesses, and you can only have our nickel if you come in and actually build the EV factories here and everything else. In globalization world, Malaysia does better than Indonesia. In multipolar world, Indonesia does better than Malaysia. So you sort of have to have your countries right there in general. And then the other thing that I would say is that... Um, I think we're at a pretty tremendous moment of sort of global tech innovation and energy transition. And these moments of geopolitical competition, when you get public-private partnership in these really critical areas, it usually means the birth of new industries and of sort of major stepwise changes. So think about the U.S. semiconductor industry in the 1950s. That's because of the Cold War and because the United States needed to put semiconductors on missiles to make them more accurate. So everything that happens there afterwards is because of that geopolitical concern. And if you've been able to identify that at the time, that's a trend you could have ridden for a long time. Ditto that with the switch from coal to oil in the early 1900s. That happens because the British Navy decides it's going to 
have oil fired ships rather than coal fired ships. And that sort of solves the debate. And we're talking about oil companies now in general. Um, so I'm looking for those areas. I'm looking for um, you know, companies that are in the energy transition that are part of what's happening with um, the power of compute, which you know, AI gets sort of subsumed in that. But as we get more computing power, what does that mean? Um, biotech is also a really interesting sector. So I'm looking for the national champions in countries that have good geopolitical fundamentals in those themes that are too important to get screwed up by multipolar geopolitics, so important that they get those public-private partnerships. Those are the themes that we like to try to ride ourselves um, in dealing with this. And that's why I say like, you can make a lot of money trading. Like, uh, you can also lose a lot of money trading. Like, uh, we've gotten some things. Like, last two years ago, we got natural gas <laughs> completely right. This year, we got natural gas completely wrong, licking our wounds. Like, trading is fun. But I, I do think there are opportunities here to oh. invest, to find the, the next Intel, to find the next standard oil. Like, those opportunities are out there. And those are not opportunities that come around very often. Jacob Sapiro of Cognitive Investments. It was a pleasure hosting you again at Macro Sunday, and I hope to see you back soon on the show. Yeah, well, let's let's do it sooner than six months because who knows what the world will look like then. <laughs> Indeed. We're back uh, in the studio from the uh, interview with uh, Jacob Shapiro. Great guy, very knowledgeable, um, interesting network in DC, etc. So, um, Michael, one thing I'd like your take on. Uh, now that we discuss this divergence between Europe and the US, um, is the political situation in Europe um, surrounding supporting the economy to the same extent that we see in the US. Uh, we've heard stories this week of the Germans struggling already now with budgeting ahead of 2025. Austerity measures may be uh, planned basically as a consequence of the constitution. So how do you view the political picture in, in Europe when it comes to the fiscal side of things here? It's going to be very, very tough for some of these countries, extremely, especially if, uh, if interest rates remain at this level. Mm -hmm. uh, for Germany especially, but for some, but, but for a lot of other countries, we, we're looking at, uh, at an election season where uh, wing parties, both to the left and the right, are uh, doing very well in polls. And they uh, usually come with value-based agendas, as we call them here. So so not necessarily solutions for, for, for economic problems, uh, mainly because I don't think there's a uh, crisis mentality around the economy in Europe very many places, not even in Germany, where, where it really should be. It should be the number one topic for the German election, but it's not really. So I think uh, for, for a lot of these countries, uh, they're looking, at, especially countries like Germany and France, are looking at some sort of awakening where the economic agenda has to, to return to the top of the political agenda. Yeah. And just uh, last week, we received the Q4 numbers from Germany, mm -hmm. a negative growth of 0.3%. I think negative growth is on the table again in Q1. Um, and again here, it's in sharp contrast to what's ongoing in the US. Mm -hmm. So it leads me to the final sort of <laughs> trillion dollar question of the week. When will these central banks cut interest rates? Um, it's very, very tricky to answer that question right now, uh, given the volatility in US key figures and all that. But here's my take, and I'll, I'll try and make it short. The European Central Bank is still wrong on the three main parameters that they track wages inflation and growth growth will likely surprise to the downside of the 0.2 projection they have in q1 inflation will likely surprise to the downside of the 2.9 percent hicp average they have penciled in for q1 and wages will have to move sideways from here to sort of confirm the picture in their wage forecast which even includes an acceleration in the second quarter could it be that we get a reacceleration of all of these underlying trends in Europe in the second half of the year? I wouldn't rule that out, but we will certainly see it in the US first. That's typically how a cycle plays out. Um, so my point here is I think the window of opportunity is increasing or improving for the European Central Bank. Well, you could argue that it's closing yeah. for the Federal Reserve. Um, first cut. March or April for, for the European Central Bank. I know that's kind of the easy guess now. Federal Reserve, no cut in the first half of the year. That would be my, on the spot, my best guess. Um, let's see in the second half of the year, but not, I mean, right now they cannot cut. I mean, the economy is too hot, so they cannot cut. Uh, Bank of England, well, I think there's a window of opportunity for them towards the end of the second quarter. Uh, but still, we're, we're kind of sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting for those 
goddamn cuts, right? <laughs> um, and how do you then trade this? Yeah. Well, I think being short the euro versus the dollar, which we've been for a while, is still a strong case. I think being long U.S. assets, given that the U.S. economy is mm. is reaccelerating relative to um, to peers, makes a ton of sense. Still, I mean, strong week for technology, uh, at least reporting wise, last week. Um, and ultimately, I think the right bet here is to bet on some sort of reflationary move in the yield curve in the US. For example, paying the two five cents fly, or in layman terms, just paying five year interest rates in the US, expect them to increase given the amount of cuts priced in. Um, and I'm saying this on the back of a repricing on Friday. So, in relative terms, US interest rates up relative to both European. Uh, peers, I mean sterling and euro. Yeah, euro dollar down, <laughs> and, and yeah, you wanted to say something, Lou? Just a quick note. Quick note on uh, on the long oil bet. Uh, mm. I think what we saw this week was uh, beginning rumors of a truce between Israel and Hamas. Yes, I wrote about this in my great game uh, for the past two weeks. That it seems like all these troubles in the Middle East, the one cut of Damocles, or what, 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 no, that, that's not the right term. Anyway, the one th- solution to all these is a peace between Israel and Hamas. Yeah. Uh, and that's why whenever there's rumors of now a peace is going to come, it hits all. R- 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 yeah. immediately yeah. so the long oil bet in my opinion still has some weeks in it uh, yeah. because I, I believe your piece still is some weeks away but it is a risky bet because uh, it's anybody guess anybody's guess if suddenly a peace agreement is is, is reached um so it's uh, a thing to consider a thing to to really look out for for these peace developments because it seems like the the oil price is uh, uh, is hinged on that at the moment yeah uh, i i certainly agree and we're currently long oil yeah. uh, struggling a little bit with that bet uh given the rumors of a peace deal uh, was it on Thursday or Friday? Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, even though that <laughs> headline was taken down again by Al Jazeera, oil didn't you recover. Longer. No, yeah. no. Um, so tricky one. Um, I think we will leave it at that. Uh, please visit stenoresearch.com if you're interested in following our, our portfolio ideas, our research on a running basis. Always two weeks free trial. Um, so go have a look, uh, or else we'll see you again next Sunday in the Macro Sunday podcast. Remember, before you tune out, that uh, we have the best disclaimer in the world. So here is Gennaro Katsuzu disclaiming our trade ideas. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit.